signs and warnings are important to pay attention to. Just about anywhere you go, you will come into contact with some kind of warning, whether it may be in the form of announcements, symbols, lights, etc. We often are governed and controlled by these warnings, like the ones we receive from police, governments, doctors and employers. Not heeding these warnings can result in some big consequences. When we do pay attention to these warnings and follow the rules and laws in place, we tend to live safer lives and the same goes for the warnings in the Bible. You see, God put warnings in the Bible for our own benefit and too often the most ignored warnings are those in the Bible. The first warning God ever gave was just after creation and he gave it to Adam and Eve and unfortunately they both ignored that warning and it came at a great cost to all of humanity. So let's take a look at some of the warnings in the word of God. One thing that God warns us against in his word is against laziness. Solomon has much to say about laziness in the book of Proverbs. He sees it as a sure way to arrive at poverty. Nothing good can come from laziness according to the wise King Solomon. I just want to read you a passage of scripture regarding laziness. Proverbs 10 verse 4 states, He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Verse 5, He who gathers in the summer is a wise son, he who sleeps in the harvest is a son who causes shame. Let me read these two verses to you again in another version. This is the contemporary version. Laziness brings poverty. Hard work makes one rich. A wise son harvests in the summer. A disgraceful son sleeps right through harvest. It is clear to see that the Bible does not encourage laziness. It encourages hard work. Every word in the Bible screams the word persistence and hard work and diligence to us. The difference between being a prince with God and a common drifter is persistence. The difference between being a prince with God and a common drifter is persistence. When you open the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel talks about the four faces of the man of God. And he said the first face of the man of God is the face of a lion. Bold. For the Bible says the righteous are as bold as a lion. The second face is the face of an eagle because you are destined for high flight. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall rise on the wings of faith and sit in the presence of God. The third face is, a th is the face of a man. It means this, that though you may associate with kings and prime ministers and presidents, don't ever lose the common touch to enjoy and appreciate the common people. But the fourth face is the one I'm driving at for this sermon, is the face of an ox. An ox is a plotter. An ox is persistent. Put an ox in front of a plow and all day long at the same pace he pulls that plow through the stumps and over the rocks. He just keeps on pulling. A donkey will bray and they'll stop and they'll delay. But an ox just keeps on pulling and keeps on pulling and he transforms that God forsaken piece of real estate into a beautiful garden of produce. Let me tell you something. God is not looking for dash and flash. He's looking for plotters. As a Christian, we must always demonstrate decisive and vibrant action, both in our personal life and in our spiritual life. In the book of Jeremiah, it states, And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. You see, finding God is not an endeavor that you can do half-heartedly. You cannot have a lazy attitude to spiritual things and expect to find God. You need to throw everything you have, everything, there needs to be a deep desire, a hunger, a hunger to find Him. There is no room for laziness. 
Prayer must undergird our walk. It is difficult to understand this when we make prayer an event and not a dialogue. Prayer is easiest when understood as being in constant communion with God, being aware of his presence, talking to him and expecting him to speak to you back. I believe one of the greatest shortcomings in our homes and in our country is the lack of prayer. The Bible does not say men ought to always sing. The Bible does not say men ought to always preach. But it does say men ought to always pray. This discipline is so important that the Lord Jesus Christ said men ought to always pray and not to faint. Paul states, pray without ceasing. Everything God does is to answer to prayer. But yet we don't pray. Whatever you may be facing today, I want to remind you there is a God in heaven who is bigger than whatever you are facing. He is a God who is able to do exceedingly and above, above all that we can ask or think. This is why having a lazy attitude towards our prayer life is not in our best interest because when we do not pray we go through our lives alone when we don't have to when we don't pray we fight the battles of life alone when we don't have to when we don't pray we engage in spiritual warfare alone when we don't have to god is approachable through prayer moving on to anger it is hard to imagine the customary deposition of a believer to be a heart filled with anger. Yet there is the possibility that some of us are walking about with flared nostrils and taking offense at the drop of a dime. This will lead to the bittering of our soul and will destroy our walk with God. Matthew chapter 5 verse 22 strongly warns us against being angry with our brothers and sisters. Often when we get angry, we tend to lose control and say things that we later on regret. This puts us in danger of grieving the Holy Spirit. Anger is detrimental to our spiritual walk in the sight of God. And moving on from anger, we look at a warning that's in the Bible that's closely linked to anger, which is the untamed tongue. James 3 makes some striking statements against the untamed tongue. It corrupts the entire body and changes the course of things, sets things ablaze and is a world of evil. The tongue should be used to bring glory to God, to preach the gospel and to teach God's word. It should be used to encourage and exhort believers. The untamed tongue does not do that and even if it does, it will quickly slander, gossip, curse and tear down and even lie. And lying is one of the main sins that grieves the Holy Spirit. We must bring this small member of our body into subjection if we are to take forward strides with God. And then we move on to selfishness. We are called as believers to be agents of love. Love is sacrificial. It isn't self-caring, it isn't self-serving, me, me, me. That's not what love is about. There is a multiplicity of scriptures that warns against selfish ambitions. Philippians 2 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. This kind of habit is displeasing to God and leads to dark and fertile places. James 3 concurs and states, for where you have envy and selfish ambitions, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Wow. The root of evil practice is selfishness. Selfishness is the problem. And the Bible has so many warnings against selfishness. We are called to exhibit love that isn't puffed up with selfishness and self-gratification. You see, people who are children of God are unselfish. Now, let us consider the habit of worry. It can come across as harmless because often we worry without deciding to worry. 
but the damage that is done is subtle and if left to fester, worry can even result in physical ailments. Why does the Bible warn against worry? Plain and simply put, Jesus himself told us not to worry. It is a futile exercise. Worry does not address or solve the issue at hand. We must embrace Matthew chapter 6 verse 25 to 34. I encourage you to read it in your own time. The imperative command of our Lord and Saviour here should not be defied. Do not worry. Also, the act of worrying is faithless. If we walk with God, we must trust in Him, that He will provide all our needs according to His splendor and glory. Hebrews 11 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. We must keep our hope alive if we are going to live successful spiritual lives. God says, do not worry, put your faith in me. Look at the lilies, I have clothed them. And I will clothe you, look at the birds, I have fed them and I will feed you. To please God, the saints must put aside worry and walk in faith. This is why the Bible says it is impossible to please God without faith. So I asked you today, do you think worry pleases God? Because effectively what you are saying when you are worrying is you think your problem or the situation that you are going through is bigger than the God you serve. And you and me both know that's incorrect. God will not leave you hanging. God is interested in from you, is your faith. It is impossible to please him without faith. That is the only way to bring good pleasure to God. God is happiest when we put our faith in him. Above all else, look at what Jesus said to his disciples in John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. So I encourage you today, let your hearts not be troubled. We all know what this year has brought, the amount of uncertainty and everything that is going on. But I encourage you to hold on to John 14. Let your hearts not be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Circumstances may be against you, people may be against you, your own family may be against you. All these things may be against you, even the world may be against you. But I am here to remind you that God is for you and with God you're the majority. Proverbs 1 24 Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. Proverbs 1 28-29 Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge, and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way, and be filled with their own devices. Proverbs 1 33 But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear of evil. God gives the world an invitation to make him their Lord, but at the same time, there is real and serious warning of rejecting such a wonderful gift. The cross of Jesus Christ is the best gift anyone could ever receive. To have all your sins forgiven, to have a restored relationship with God. But the cross has a price. God's only Son was sacrificed that sinners might live. To reject the gospel is to reject Jesus. That is why the message I have for you consists of two points an invitation to eternal relationship with Jesus Christ and a warning to anyone who thinks tomorrow is guaranteed. 1. The Invitation from the Lord Isaiah 55, 6-7 Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, 
and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. This invitation is made to anyone, but especially worthwhile to anyone who is thirsting for the eternal living water. John 14, 4 But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, call ye upon him while he is near. Isaiah 55, 6 So how does someone seek the Lord? First of all, seeking the Lord means calling on him. Every person is responsible for their own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He is the only mediator between God and man. You cannot have your parents or pastor do this for you. On the day of judgment, our lives will not be reviewed collectively. You will stand there on your own. Therefore, we cannot depend on other people's salvation with the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to focus on your own. They can guide you but the decision will always be between you and Jesus Christ. This means that you must call upon the Lord, and you must do this yourself. No one is going to be in heaven by association, and no one is going to be in heaven by accident. Everyone there will have made an intentional decision to seek the Lord for themselves. So I ask you today, do you truly know God? Have you called out to him? Or are you depending on God's relationship with your wife or husband or parents? If this is you today, find time, or better yet, make time with God and talk to him. This is one of the greatest warnings in the Bible. The prophet Isaiah told us, he told us this, seek the Lord while he may be found. We can conclude that this statement from Isaiah the prophet suggests that there will be a point in time, a point in human history where God will not be found. Seeking the Lord is diligently pursuing him, diligently making time to be in his presence, diligently pursuing the things of God to know his word. And most importantly, seeking the Lord means repenting of your wicked ways. This is quite simple and means to let go of anything that God hates by ceasing to have anything to do with it. This is not a suggestion, but rather something that one must definitely do if one is to return to the Lord. Is there a secret sin that you are holding on to, one that no one knows about but you, one you've been living with for years and you've grown accustomed to it? Let me ask you a question. Is that sin worth it? Is it worth missing out on the Lord for it? Is it worth missing out on heaven for it? My friend, seek the Lord while he can be found. Time is moving. History is moving. The pages of history are being written. And we are fast approaching this wonderful warning of the prophet Isaiah. Notice how I refer to it as a wonderful warning. It is wonderful. Do you want to know why? because it also suggests that God can currently be found. The windows of heaven have opened, my friend. You can find God. Back in the Old Testament days, once a year, the high priest alone could go into the Holy of Holies. But in New Testament days, every believer is a priest, and we may not only go into the Holy of Holies, we may live in the Holy of Holies, and we can find God. The good news is that you will not do this alone, as the Holy Spirit of God will help you. That is because the Holy Spirit will guide you to the Lord. John 16, 13 through 14. How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will shew unto you things to come. He shall glorify me, he shall receive of mine, and shall shew it unto you. Yielding to the Holy Spirit will make you produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit that will make you a bright light to a dark world. Philippians 2.15 
that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. But those who choose to walk their own path without God, God will give you what you want. He will leave you alone. And this is the warning. It is not a sign of wisdom to try to second-guess God. The scriptures speak of God's ways to be. Isaiah 55, 8 For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. To conclude that we know better than Almighty God is a horrible mistake, one that many people make all the time. God is not the author of confusion, and not taking his invitation seriously means such a gift will be taken away, especially when someone least expects it. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. There is an old church saying, You can't repent too soon, but soon it may be too late. What you think you have today, be it a church or a family member who is a Christian, there is no guarantee you will have that tomorrow. The good news is Jesus is giving you the opportunity to follow him now. Trust in him today and do not delay. As the saying goes, it's better late than never. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2, 4 through 6 and 8 through 10. If God opened up the book of your whole life today, will he find it to be holy? The answer is a guaranteed no. For none of us are holy. Anything that is holy yet has sin is by definition unholy. That is why all of us need the Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts. This is God's universe and he has created laws for it. Laws that you must keep and even though he loves you, there are consequences when you break them. And it is because he loves you that this is why the Bible tells us this truth. Hebrews 9 verse 27 And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. You only have one life, only one. And you will have to give account for this life. And when that day comes, when that day of judgment comes, what will you say? I am pretty certain that we have all heard the term, you reap what you sow growing up. But let's assume that you've never heard of it. Well, there is another saying which I believe means something similar. The saying is, what goes around comes around. Now most of us never take that saying seriously. We think that we can do bad things and have no consequences, have no repercussions. But everything you do will have an effect on your life. It may not be instant, it may not be obvious to the naked eye, but believe me when I tell you, it will affect you. It is unfortunate how some of us don't take that saying seriously, you reap what you sow. Some of us are not even aware that the saying originated from the Bible. Yes, the Bible in Galatians 6 verse 7. That is why we must strive to do good and sow into our lives what is good so that we can reap good things. This is one of those rare verses that both communicates the connotation of blessing and judgments. It urges us to do the right thing and warns us against doing the wrong thing. Listen, don't take my word for it. Let us take a look at the scriptures. 
Galatians chapter 6 verses 6 through 10. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. I don't think some of you heard that right. It says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. You cannot constantly be angry at people, rude to other people, and expect to live a peaceful life. If you sow anger, you cannot reap peace in your life. You cannot sow hate in the lives of others and expect to reap happiness. It is true what they say. We are today what we did yesterday, and we are tomorrow what we did today. If you are unkind, you can expect unkindness to come toward you. If you are merciful, you can expect others to be merciful to you. If you are generous, others will be generous to you. You cannot expect to plant carrot seeds and harvest tomatoes. It does not work in the physical realm. Neither does it work in the spiritual realm. God even operates this way when it comes to our forgiveness. The only condition to our forgiveness is that we may forgive others. You can't escape this law. Another way you may reap what you sow is through your children. We all know that the way a person parents affects the child significantly shaping and molding the sort of person they become. Have you ever noticed yourself doing or saying the same thing that your parents would? And you catch yourself thinking, I sound just like my father or mother. That is because their actions had an effect on you. What you sow can not only affect you, but your children, whether it is good or bad. The sins you commit today believing it will only be your problem, that is simply not true. These types of things follow in the bloodlines, presenting more challenges for your children to overcome. The reaping does not only occur in your life, but in the lives of your offspring. Now, I'm not saying your offspring will definitely commit the same sin. No, each man is judged by their own sins, but they are influenced by what they see. What I am saying is that the same strategy the enemy used on you and you gave in to sin, the enemy will employ this same tactic on your offspring. And if they are not strong in the Lord, they will fall into the same enemy's trap. You have a responsibility to sow good things in your life, and your child's life will reap good things. Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You are setting an example for your children whether it be good or bad, they will follow you. Even when you think they haven't noticed anything, they know, they are watching. As Christians, Jesus sets that example for us, and as followers of him, we must attempt to be like Christ. We're used to hearing people say, oh look, they're following in their father's footsteps. But if only we knew how true that statement was. We must follow in our Father's footsteps, follow the example He set for us in the Bible, what He has taught us right from wrong. If you find yourself going in a different direction from Christ, you must ask yourself a question. In whose footsteps am I really following? Who do I consider my Father? Whose example am I following? The one who died for my sins on the cross? Or am I following something or someone else? If you find yourself not happy with the way your life is going, take a look at what you have sowed in your life. We are planting seeds every single day. It may be lies, deceit, impatience, anger, jealousy, arrogance, selfishness, gossip. 
Yes, gossip is a sin. Not many people consider it to be, but it is there in the Bible. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 16 says, You shall not go about as a talebearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. In fact, let's look at Proverbs 10:18. Whoever hides hatred has lying lips, and whoever spreads slander is a fool. Now I don't need to expand on that particular verse. The message is as clear as day. But don't be surprised when you gossip about people and then find out that they have also been spreading lies about you. Don't be surprised if people you talk about behind their backs start talking about you. You reap what you sow. But if you allow the Holy Spirit to influence your life and begin to live a life that sows in godly things, you will reap the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. When we exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, our lives are a manifestation of the transformation they have undergone by the power of God. Galatians 5, verse 22 to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Imagine the beauty of a life that is led by the Spirit and that manifests these characteristics. I've seen saints who have been in hospital and were in excruciating pain in the toughest moments of their life, physically, but they were still joyful. Why? Because they were filled with the Spirit. We must live out our holiness by demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit towards others. As His children, we must mirror the love of our Father towards those who come in contact with. Some people are waiting in eager anticipation for a godlike love from a holy person. We must be those persons. Holiness is not attained by following the law. It comes and flourishes when we follow the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5 verse 18 But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Being religious and ritualistic doesn't bring holiness. It brings bondage and false righteousness. Jesus often chided the Pharisees and the Sadducees for that kind of righteous according to the law. What Jesus wants from us is to surrender to the guidance of the Holy Spirit, daily echoing the sentiments of the song, where he leads me I will follow, I'll go with him, with him all the way. As believers, our purpose is to bear good fruit. The same Greek word for fruit, karpos, in Galatians 5 and John 15, derives from the meaning to produce or to be a result of something. So when we produce good fruit in our lives, it reflects the depth of our spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity involves fighting a daily spiritual battle that consists of denying your flesh and choosing to walk in the Spirit. But when we live in sin, we provide an unhealthy environment for the wretched disease of sin to manifest itself. When we allow sin to hinder the growth of the fruit that God desires to cultivate within us, we cannot produce good life. The Bible says, For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. If you focus on things of this world, if you sow things that only pertain to the things of the flesh, you will only reap corruption. But we as believers have another option. If we sow to the Spirit, we will reap everlasting life. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds infinitely better than corruption. As believers, we all know that we have an arch enemy, the devil. And he stalks and he listens, looking for an opportunity to enter our lives. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant. 
because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. We can see from this verse that he's walking around looking for an opportunity to get into your life. In Job chapter 1, we find that at a point in time, there was a day where the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came among them. Verse 7 in Job chapter 1 tells us something rather interesting. A conversation between the Lord and Satan occurred. Verse 7 states, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down it. Notice what the devil told God he was doing. He was walking up and down earth, looking. As believers, we think that only angels, the angels of the Lord are the ones that are watching us. But no, equally, we need to be mindful that the devil and his army are also watching, looking for an opportunity to enter our lives and try to destroy them. This is why we are given an explicit warning in Ephesians 4.27. Do not give the devil a foothold. Now, let us not give him room in our homes or in our lives. Now, let us look at ways people unknowingly may be giving room to the devil or inviting him in their life. Let's begin with the tongue. There is power in the tongue and utterances. We often say things that we don't really mean out of anger, frustration, sheer ignorance, or even as a joke. We might not only mean these things, but the truth is they have weight and influence in our lives. There is power in the tongue. As a believer, we have to be sure we bridle our tongue and censor what comes out of our mouth about ourselves and about other people at every point we speak. What are you saying? What are you saying? There is power in your tongue, the words you speak. So many believers paint pictures and romanticize about their pains, sadness, disease, or challenges to make them look like they are an integral part of their lives. You hear people saying, my headache has begun. My headache has begun. When did it become yours? Or you hear people saying, it's normal for me to suffer from pain periodically. We might not know, but we are subtly using our mouths to confess and normalize that disease. The devil sees this and banks on it. Why does a headache have to be my headache is back? By saying that, you're taking ownership of it. Another thing people say is I'm sick to death. Child of God, don't say that. You have absolutely no idea how powerful the tongue is. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And by you saying things like that, you're inviting pain and sickness with your words. Watch what you say. The devil is powerful, but he doesn't have as much power as we attribute him to have. The devil knows spiritual laws better than most believers. Therefore, he is sneaky and knows how to play his cards well. Hosea 4.6 says, My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. We are destroyed for not knowing spiritual principles. And this Bible right here is full of them, is full of every spiritual principle that you need to get through this life successfully. You see, if we don't give him room, you see, if we don't give him room and the opening to penetrate into our lives, he can't come in. The devil cannot just enter into our lives unless we give him permission in some capacity. One of the ways we give him permission is through the tongue, negative confession, negative utterances. There is power in the tongue. Though it's a very small member of the body, it is a very powerful tool. It has the power to destroy or create. 
The words we utter from our mouth can create the realities that we see come to pass in our lives. Ephesians 4.29 Do not let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up of others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. The things we always profess and confess have a way of creeping their way into our lives or happening eventually in our lives. The devil and his agents have a very crafty way of using our very own words as a gateway to access our lives. Be careful what you say. Be careful what you even say about your family members. There is power in the tongue. That's why we have to be careful in how we use it. Whenever we are at our lowest and feel like saying negative things about ourselves, we should confess God's blessings and hold on to his promises. Stop saying you're not good enough. Stop saying you won't amount to anything. Stop confessing negative things about yourself. We should choose to only believe God's report in our lives. Our adversary is always on the prowl, counting and waiting for every ungodly or negative utterance that will allow him to enter into our lives. Take control of your tongue. Be mindful what you say. Another way we invite him is when we bring accursed objects into our home. If we want God's presence to dwell and tabernacle with us, we have to create an enabling atmosphere, an enabling environment, a place where the Holy Spirit can dwell. This is why the Bible tells us so clearly, be ye holy, for I am holy. Although some people might say that this sounds so Old Testament and not the reality that this generation of believers should profess, it's true. What are you bringing into your home? Many believers have brought images, idols, dolls and forbidden items into their homes, all in the name of interior decoration. Now I want to ask you a question, is interior decoration more important to you than the sanctity of your home? Is it more important than having the Holy Spirit dwell in your home? You need to have a review of what is in your home. Deuteronomy 7 verse 25 to 26 states, You shall burn the carved images of their gods with fire. You shall not covet the silver or the gold that is on them, nor take it for yourself, lest you be snared by it. For it is an abomination to the Lord your God, nor shall you bring an abomination into your house, lest you be doomed into destruction like it. You shall utterly detaste it and utterly abhor it, for it is an accursed thing. Just listen to this phrase. Nor shall you bring an abomination into your house, lest you be doomed to destruction like it. We buy some objects only for their aesthetic representation without taking time to deeply think or be introspective or pray to know the origins or the inspiration behind them. Objects like these give way for vicious attacks and bondages. It can be even a small piece of jewelry or a work of art that hangs loosely on your wall. I'm just encouraging you today's brothers and sisters, be careful what you bring into your home. We must pray for God's wisdom to know which objects we can keep or destroy completely in our homes. There are countless stories where people have brought objects into their homes and have opened doorways into their homes. They wish they hadn't. They hear footsteps. They see strange lights, strange knockings. Be vigilant about what comes into your home. Now let us look at the final door that we will look at today. 
and that is stubbornness. A good example of people who were constantly stubborn were the scribes. Stephen referred to them as stiff-necked, always resisting the Holy Spirit. You stiff-neck and uncircumcised in your heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your father did, so do ye. We know the word of God. We know what the word of God says and what it is telling us to do. But yet we are stubborn in our ways, stubborn in our thoughts, wanting to live our life our way and not God's way. My friend, if you are not living according to the word of God, you are living an exposed life. The word of God is there for our own benefit. Also, if you are not yielding to the Holy Spirit, who is the author of the word of God, you are living an exposed life. We as believers need to yield to the Holy Spirit. I have just spoken about three of the doors that can potentially let the enemy into your life. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 27, we are told not to give any room to the enemy. And we should listen to this. The Bible was written by people who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Every single one of the scriptures we see in the Holy Bible are from the Holy Spirit. Within the Bible, we are told how we as children of God should live our lives. God has our best interest at his heart. He is only interested in your well-being and your eternal spirit. That is why the Bible does not sugarcoat or dance around particular subjects. Within the Bible, we are instructed on how we are to conduct ourselves as believers and how we should live our lives. This is why we should constantly read the Word of God and have knowledge of it, so that the Word of God, along with the Holy Spirit, can guide us through this life and into eternity. Let us begin. Have you ever felt like saying something really harsh? I mean, something really hurtful to someone in retaliation to what they said to you? But then, just when you feel that anger welling up in you and about to rush over and spill it out in a form of meanness and vileness, something touches your soul and you pause to reconsider? We all have those moments when we want to defend ourselves with our strength because we feel cheated or short-changed. But the Holy Spirit nudges us otherwise and tells us to hold ourselves back. In James' epistle, the Bible charges and shows us the perfect template for responding to issues and handling matters that might arise in our daily lives. The Holy Spirit is constantly guiding us on the will of the Father and how to best model our lives. There are always subtle warnings and signs He impresses on our spirits on how to effectively walk our journey of faith. Here are four of them. Warning number one. Watch your speech. The mouth. Though the smallest part of the body is very powerful, the things we say with our mouth can either make or break us. They can either bless us or curse us. As believers, we are urged to bridle our tongue and be careful of the words that proceed out of our mouths. They carry power. The Bible makes us understand that there is power of life and death in the tongue. We should always make positive confessions and not bring doom or setbacks into our lives because of our utterances. I hear a lot of children of God saying, that scared me to death. 
It's not a laughing matter, don't say that. Or when a loved one says they are not feeling well and you reply, Oh you poor thing. Why do you describe your loved one as something you wouldn't want them to be? I know all of these things appear small, but the Bible tells us clearly our enemy, the devil, goes to and fro on the earth and walks up and down on it, looking for an opportunity to enter people's lives. Our enemy, the devil, does not fight far and will even use something as small as that to enter our lives. We should be mindful of the things we say to people and the consequences of what we say to ourselves and about ourselves. Our words should always be befitting of a believer and a follower of Christ. Colossians 4 verse 6 puts it aptly. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how to answer every man. Also, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason, so that we can listen more and say less. We aren't supposed to react to everything insolence tossed at us or be too excited to respond to a situation that we say inappropriate things. We should always take that one minute pause and listen to the guide of the Holy Spirit. James 1 verse 19 advises us to be slow to speak and slow to wrath. The first reaction isn't always the best reaction. And the truth is one sentence has the ability to damage 20 years of a relationship. James 1 verse 19 Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Warning number two, anger. Whenever we are aroused to get angry and spit words that we would likely regret later, we should take a clue from Jesus on what he said about forgiveness. Seventy times, seven times in a day. This isn't literally talking about forgiving someone seventy times, seven times. But how idle could you be to keep a record of how many times someone gets on your nerve in a day? How annoying could they really get? They will definitely be offenses. People will always get on our nerves, that is inevitable. We can't decide or control that, but we can control how we would respond to these offences. Anger is not a fruit of the Spirit and, of course, shouldn't be a trait that abounds in the heart of a child of God. Ephesians gives us almost a chance to express our anger, but we should also let it vanish almost immediately. Ephesians 4 verse 26 and 27 Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. We are human. And anger is a human emotion, but don't sin in your anger. This simply means that every time we let anger thrive and linger in our hearts, we give the devil a loophole to penetrate and have a soft landing in our hearts. Don't ever make decisions in your anger. One decision made in anger can change the trajectory of your whole life. Warning 3. Doubts. A doubtful person isn't just wasting his or her time in God's presence. Such fellow will receive nothing in the presence of God. 
When we ask, we must connect our faith with our requests and believe that God is going to answer. Once we flinch and start doubting, it means we are placing a limit on what God can do. That way we won't receive anything from our Father. The book of James chapter 1 verse 6 likens a double-minded person to a wave of the sea driven by the wind. James 1 verse 6 and 7 But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. The final warning we are going to look at given by the Holy Spirit in the Bible is pride. James 4 verse 6 But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Every sin started from this point. Before humanity was created, this one sin created war in heaven. There is a popular saying that pride goes before a fall. Even when a prideful person is approaching a pit and is on the brink of sinking deep, nobody would tell him, because he wouldn't just listen. He would rather do what pleases him. God resists the proud and uplifts the humble. This resistance could be akin to the deposal of the devil and relegating him forever to condemnation. We should subject ourselves to God's will and forsake every haughtiness of heart that makes us always beam the searchlight on ourselves and not God. Pride is a sin because it makes us have a self-centered perspective rather than solely focusing on God. I honestly believe this is one of the greatest warnings in the Bible, arguably the greatest warning. What James 4 verse 6 tells us is there is something about the nature of pride that makes God directly oppose it. What a life! Imagine a life of having God against you. We should strive to humble so that we may have grace from the Lord God Almighty. Conclusion, we are not perfect or complete in ourselves. So we should continually subject ourselves to the teachings and guidance of the Holy Spirit. We should let Him walk through us and work in us to break down every stronghold of our natural man and flesh by heeding to his constant warnings and signals.